We just met Jean Piaget and his emphasis on the development and maturation of the processes of change within an individual and his cognitive constructivism in which the developing child is seen as an active explorer of the world, changed by its encounters and drawing and constructing meaning therefrom. We now turn to Lev Vygotsky, born the same year, in a very, very different context, whose grounding in the early Soviet Republic uh, focused on the development of a child within a society and culture, the child understood as a principally socially constructed being. He died in 1934, but it wasn't until 1962 that his seminal work, Thought and Language, was published in English. And he shares this with a whole bunch of other intellectuals whose work was ongoing in the few years after the Soviet Revolution. Revolutions have a way of doing this. They break down old barriers between subjects. They make the new possible. Things didn't go very well in, in the Soviet Union, as you're well aware, and Stalin had uh, terrible, terrible effects. Um, so there was a brief window then in which the early Soviet Union gave rise to a flurry of academic work in a variety of disciplines. And some of this is still not terribly well known in the West. Um, we've learned from the physiologist Bernstein, uh, characters like Luria, who studied memory, Leontief Bakhtin. Mikhail Bakhtin is particularly important for his theory of dialogism. And there's many others as well, whose work is just not yet well known, um, but has, is, provides us with a rich source of insight from this particularly fruitful period. Now, for Vygotsky, learning and development happen in a social context always. And things that we like to ascribe to an individual, those cognitive capacities that Piaget was mapping out, for Vygotsky, these are not to be attributed solely to the individual. They develop first in an intersubjective context between people, and they later become internalized. So Vygotsky is very focused on the interactions between children, both with their peers and with uh, their caregivers. Um, and it's in this context that those skills and capacities first become manifest, that the child will later learn to internalize. This gives rise to one of his most profound theoretical offerings, which is the zone of proximal development. The idea of the zone of proximal development builds on this insight that um, challenges are overcome and skills acquired in a social context between people first. So for any random child, we might pick a child and we might observe that this child is capable of doing X, Y, and Z on its own. Um, but together with a teacher or a competent peer, it can do more, just as you can do more with your laptop than you can without your laptop. And you may be able to do more in a group setting than you can in, in glorious isolation. So those capacities which a child can um, master in company, in interaction, they belong in the zone of proximal development. And those skills and capacities which initially require the presence of someone else will eventually peel off and become part of the set of skills that the child um, has available to it in all situations as it goes on. But it has to build up to there. Things become manifest in a public space first and later become internalized. By things, I mean those capacities, those abilities to understand, parse and deal with the world which we often think of as our personal skills, they are first of all public, open and between people and only later become resources that we can draw on as individuals. Vygotsky, in his short period of work as a psychologist, um, drew our attention to the manner in which the meaning of our entire environment is co-constructed through the web of social relations within which we live. So you may think a door is just a door, but a door, any door you come to, has it within it the history of doors. It has the history of problems solved through the construction of doors. 
Um, doors are a human, a culturally based uh, solution to a sort of an abstract problem. Um, and everything in your environment is of this nature. So I've shown there a dreidel, a fork, a cake, and a door. Now the dreidel, you may say, is that's quite obviously something that's pertinent to a Jewish childhood. And you might think of the fork as just existing, but the fork is just as culturally stamped as the dreidel. The happy birthday cake also belongs to the rituals, practices of a culture in which the role of an individual is celebrated in a particular way. So the meaning of a dreidel or a birthday cake or a fork doesn't appear by magic. We learn it in an interpersonal context. We learn it by observing how other people use these, what appropriate uses are. And in this way, we internalize the cultural values and meanings around us that have created our human environment. One of Vygotsky's greatest contributions was in his work on the early stages of language learning. Vygotsky noticed something that um, I think we, once he draws our attention to it, we can all see. But this is that the early stages of language acquisition don't distinguish between an inside voice and an outside voice. Young children literally think out loud. Now, this is very interesting when we come to remind ourselves of what we were talking about when we studied language and its relation to thought. We said it's not clear that all thought is linguistic, but some thoughts, thought processes can be construed as language-like. Well, here we can actually observe those directly because little children are just not keeping it in. They're speaking their mind. They learn at a later stage, typically a few years after they begin learning language, they learn to suppress the overt expression of such thoughts. And in this way, inner language bifurcates from the language that we use in public, and it becomes compressed, idiosyncratic. It's your own shortcut for thinking. But it was Vygotsky who drew attention to this fact and made us aware of the fact that the dual purposes of language for communication and for thought have their root in a single kind of intersubjective process. Um, Vygotsky also drew atten draws attention to something which we know now to be very important, which is the role of joint attention in early language learning. We met this with the cooperative eye hypothesis of Michael Tomasello. And when you think about the situation in which a child is learning language, it's a situation in which children and caregivers or children and other children are jointly paying attention to specific things. And in this way, a shared meaning, a shared consensual meaning is constructed. So Piaget, with his focus on the individual and the, sequence, the unfolding of a preordained sequence of events, contrasts strongly with Vygotsky and his casting of the person as coming into being in a social context. They should not, however, be seen as competitors. They are drawing our attention to different aspects of human development, both of which we need to acknowledge, both of which we can see as important. And they serve as useful reminders that no theoretical framework can uh, exhaust meaning in this area. So Vygotsky gives us a form of social constructivism, where meaning is created in interaction between people. And so it's useful to contrast the cognitive constructivism of Piaget, which deals with presumed inner cognitive capacities, structures, processes, and the social constructivism of Vygotsky, which is located in the public space in which meaning is jointly created. So using different theoretical frameworks sheds different kinds of light on different aspects of our being, and they don't necessarily resolve to a single picture. They, did, they don't have to resolve to a single picture. We are not to be characterized by any single theoretical framework. We are plural and we are various. So what are the consequences here? Well, theories of development necessarily feed into theories of education. Pedagogy is a very important field, and the syllabuses and concerns of teachers don't come from nowhere. If we restrict ourselves to a single view of the human, we will end up with a single, somewhat tyrannical approach to education in which we expect the same thing from all children. If you think about it, the zone of proximal development has massive knock-on 
consequences for educators. And Piaget's notion of developmental stages has obvious consequences for educators. The zone of proximal development will encourage us to value the social interaction in which meaning is created, to encourage cooperation, collaboration, group work, and to defocus from evaluating isolated individuals. Vygotsky makes it very clear to us, for example, that our system of examination 